Today on The Real Story, spring semester is looking up. Connecticut's colleges and universities seeing the light at the end of the tunnel after a long year with COVID. This morning, Quinnipiac University President Dr. Judy Olean joins us with a look at how students are learning this semester, what's going on with graduation, and what we can expect for the summer and fall. Plus, we changed the way we voted here in Connecticut because of the pandemic, and now Connecticut is looking to make some of those changes permanent. There are two bills before the legislature right now that would expand voting access in our state. One, to make absentee ballots without an excuse, the law of the land, and another, allowing early voting in our state. This morning, Secretary of the State Denise Merrill joins us. It's all today on The Real Story. And thanks for joining us on The Real Story. I'm Jen Bernstein. The challenge of COVID is something we've extensively discussed uh, the past year here on The Real Story. It's impacted every part of our lives. And for college students, it's been a huge interruption. Quinnipiac University has had to make unprecedented changes over the last year. But now, hope. Vaccines are allowing for an easing of restrictions on campus. And now, graduation is going to go on in person in May. Joining us this morning to talk about the past year and where the university goes moving forward is Quinnipiac University President Dr. Judy Olean. Good morning. Morning, Jen. Thank you for having us. Of course. Thanks for coming on the program. So you took the reins in 2018, I was reading. Uh, so you had a couple years there before COVID hit. Tell me what you were focusing on on campus before the pandemic. Well, I had a year and three quarters. We had developed our strategic plan as the University of the Future and starting to execute on that first year of the strategic plan with a lot of new initiatives around our four pillars, which was preparing our students for careers of the 21st century to be enlightened citizens, inclusive excellence as a community that enables every individual to thrive, the third was to uh, nurture and advance the well being of our own communities and communities around us. And the fourth was lifelong learning and lifelong connections, lifelong connections with our alumni and lifelong learning for all of us uh, because uh, the rate of knowledge obsolescence is increasing and we all have to keep learning all of the time. So those were our four pillars. That's our strategic plan. It still is our strategic plan. We continue to advance it, but then COVID came along and we had to do that in parallel, deal with COVID. Yeah, so yeah, you were about a year and a half in, right? So it was, I think it was July 2018 is what I was reading now that uh, I remember what I was looking at. And so you have the, the four pillars. Those haven't changed as, as you just said, because oh. you know those can happen no matter what's going on in the world. But then you have this tsunami coming your way, this pandemic. Uh, I've said this before, you can't plan for it. There's no playbook. You're in this leadership position. What were you thinking when you were starting to hear the reports in February and in March when we all learned that our lives were gonna change? You know, I came from being a business school dean in a couple of places, and we do a lot of case studies in business schools, case scenarios. I have to say, I've never done a pandemic case study. And so this, this was new uh, for sure, and the speed and velocity with which you had to respond um, and, and try and envision what might be was, was unprecedented. So in February already, we started with a task force that from February met every day uh, our COVID task force to anticipate what measures we might take, including having to go remote uh, and then how we would teach, um, how we would keep our community safe and ongoing, the ongoing business of the community, uh, of the university, while at the same time, continuing with execution of our strategic plan in two parallel tracks, because there was always gonna be a tomorrow. There is a tomorrow. Hopefully you can see the screenshot behind me on this Zoom screen that was taken last Thursday, a gorgeous day 
on campus and you can see all everyone's out there sunbathing so there is a tomorrow and 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 you have to keep moving with your strategic plan but at the same time the responses that had to be taken immediately to safeguard the community against the unknown and it was unknown um, as it unfolded, and I can tell you that in February or March, if someone had said to me, this is going to take at least a year till you work your way through it, uh, I would have um, said, y y you're out of your mind. But I think that's, many of us that's would what be, happened. Yeah, I yeah. think many of us would be thinking that way too. Uh, I mean, it's just crazy looking back on the past year and how far we come. But as you said, you have people behind you outside, students enjoying the weather. Uh, vaccines are a big part of why you're able to start easing some of those restrictions. Uh, I know the governor had talked about doing, you know, clinics, pop-up clinics on campuses. And he had mentioned Johnson & Johnson was going to be the shot of choice for that, for students. And now we know about the shortage because of the Johnson & Johnson manufacturing mess up. So where does that stand at this point? So I, I want to give credit to our community first and foremost, because um, we have been on ground since fall of 2019. I'm sorry, since fall of 2020, the years kind of blend together here. So we, um, we, we didn't have our students come back in the spring as the boom fell on March 15th. But come fall of 2020, our students came back. We had 3,800 students in residence. And we were able to continue uh, delivering classes on ground and also hybrid because our students were such incredible partners with our faculty and staff to enabling us to continue to operate. Um, everyone transitioned on a dime to wearing masks, to social distancing. Our students couldn't visit each other in residence halls. Our faculty were incredible in switching their pedagogy to uh, online and virtual hybrid because there were some classes on ground, even in the fall, and certainly many more now in the spring. And, and so it really took the entire village, all of our facilities people, our student life people, who organized activities that still could be socially distant. But, but our students were such partners to maintaining the health and well being of the community. Now we tested every week. Now in the spring, we're testing 100% of our students, uh, uh, of our undergraduate students every week. I think we've done 56,000 tests so far this semester at an aggregate rate of um, under half a percentage point, under 0.5%. And, and that, that didn't happen because of vaccines. That happened because everyone came together in really being responsible. So now vaccines are here and uh, thankfully, Connecticut is just awesome in how it's managed uh, the distribution dissemination of the uh, vaccines. And more and more people are getting vaccinated now, including everyone over 16. The governor has said, and we wholeheartedly support this, that as many students as possible get vaccinated before they go home. Some of them will get vaccinated on the Pfizer and Moderna two shot arrangement and of course we're trying to maximize the number that can have access to uh, the j and j vaccine which is a one-shot uh, uh, arrangement i think there will be supply the question is whether there'll be enough j and j but we are strongly encouraging every person every adult person over 16 every student of ours every faculty and staff member to get vaccinated because the closer we get to 100 percent the more we can go back to normal and really relax uh, the way we're going to be delivering classes and, and, and living come full. Will you mandate the vaccine? Is that something that's being discussed? I think everyone is discussing it. Some universities, as you know, have already made that decision. We haven't made the decision yet. Uh, we're strongly encouraging. The science is very clear that vaccines are safe and uh, help us safeguard not just ourselves, but grandma, grandpa, mom and dad, and every one of your 
peers. So we're strongly encouraging it. And as we, as we get closer to the fall, uh, we will absolutely uh, reassess whether it needs to be mandated. As you know, uh, universities always mandate some vaccines already. True. All right, I want to ask you this because uh, I want to make sure we get this in. But the QU Chronicle had a really interesting article that picked up some traction uh, in our state, and it was discussing um, faculty. And the title of it is Liberal Views Are Overly Represented. Quinnipiac students discuss their educational setting. Uh, many students believe in Quinnipiac University is not diverse, it says, when it comes to the representation of different political ideologies. And they believe it has a direct impact on their learning environment. And for, interesting, from a journalism uh, perspective, they went and they looked at campaign donations from employees and analyzed that. And a lot of those uh, donations did come or did go to Democrats. So give me your reaction to this when you saw that article. Well, we, of course, don't delve into the political views of our faculty and staff. We don't scan what contributions they make. Um, you, you know, it was a great journalistic project. I think that they captured um, a number, the number of employees was about 20% of all Quinnipiac employees. That doesn't represent the whole, but I can tell you philosophically in terms of our values, we um, have a statement of inclusive values. We believe in uh, representing the spectrum of political and social views across the board. We understand that many people don't disagree, don't agree with one side or the other, might disagree, but that's what civil society is, that you confront a spectrum of views, you hear, you listen, you debate respectfully with civility, uh, but you're exposed to a broad spectrum of views that may change your own position. And that's what we're committed to at, at Quinnipiac. We certainly uh, don't uh, represent just one side of the spectrum. It needs to be the, the full range of views. And everyone should feel that their view, as long as it's civil and respectful of another, is welcome on campus. And we want to sometimes make people even uncomfortable in hearing views that are not their own. But that's exactly part of civil society, that you get used to hearing controversy. You get used to formulating your positions, whether you agree or you disagree. That's perfectly um, uh, reasonable and and exactly what we would hope for uh, among enlightened citizens. And as I said to you, our mission is to prepare students for evolving careers of the 21st century as enlightened global citizens. Is it disheartening? As Sorry, as is it disheartening? Citizen, Go ahead. You're going to hear views. As an enlightened citizen, you're going to hear a lot of views that you don't agree with. And that's exactly what we should be doing at the university. Sorry, the... the um back and forth over Zoom can be difficult sometimes. Do you find it disheartening when you hear or you're reading the article to hear that students felt like they couldn't express their views, that they'd be punished, you know, grade-wise in some way? Uh, I, 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 I certainly uh, find that surprising. We're constantly in touch with our students. Uh, I think that uh, there is a very welcoming environment uh, on campus to uh, a range of students. That's why we have such strong enrollments and retention. Um, and the students have to recognize that they really didn't capture but 20% of, uh, of the um, campus uh, employee base. And contributing to a certain party doesn't mean that you don't tolerate other views. It may mean that you personally uh, are um, aligned with those views, but I would certainly hope that faculty, staff, and students, no matter what their personal position is, are capable of embracing and listening to views uh, that are contrarian to their own. So, and true. that's certainly the culture. That's the culture that we promote at Quinnipiac. Yeah, so good to be able to have a back and forth political discussion, which we like to have here on The Real Story. I was reading your background too. You actually seem to have a little bit of journalism experience too, business journalism. I was reading that you've been published in journals. You wrote a weekly syndicated newspaper column, hosted a monthly television show on current topics in business. It's interesting. Uh, well, a, a little bit here and there for sure, but I have such great respect 
for what the journalistic community does responsibly. All right, Dr. Judy Olin, president of Quinnipiac University, really appreciate you coming on The Real Story, talking about the past year and what's currently going on, uh, on at the university. You're always welcome on The Real Story. Please come back and uh, catch up with us soon. Thank you, Jen, and I hope everyone stays well. Same. Thank you. All right, coming up, Connecticut looking to expand access to voting, bills allowing for no-excuse absentee ballots, as well as making early voting legal in our state, are considered at the state capitol right now. One of the bill's biggest proponents, Secretary of the State Denise Merrill. She's our guest. Next.